Every year at the beginning of the new year, we wish one another a happy new year. In huge denial of the facts, time is passing. What happens is time passes. People grow old. They go ill. They die. They get reborn again. And it happens all over again, again and again. There's a sutta where the Buddha goes for alms at the house of a Brahmin, and the next day he goes to the house again. The Brahmin puts food in his bowl, and then he goes the next day again. The Brahmin puts more food in his bowl. On the third day, the Brahmin complains, what is this pesky contemplative comes every day, again and again, for food? And the Buddha points out, and again and again, people take birth again and again, people grow ill. Again and again they die, they get carried off to the charnel ground, and again and again they take birth again. The question is, when are you going to have enough? There's a temptation to say, well, next time around I want it to be better, and you try to arrange for it to be better. But then it's going to fall apart again. And all too often when things get better, people get complacent. Think of the devas. Anything they want appears. Can you can imagine how spoiled you can get if anything you wanted just appeared. And after been sp having been spoiled for a while, then they have to fall. It's that much harder to deal with the fact that their wishes don't come true anymore, or well, they come true only with a lot of effort. See, here we are trying to develop some goodness, in hopes of the rewards of goodness. But then the rewards, if you hold on to them, turn on you. They bite you. The question is, when will you have had enough? As the Buddha said to that Brahmin, only when you've developed the discernment that can let go of these things, then you don't have to come back again and again to what he called it again becoming, further becoming. It's all fueled by our craving. There's the same sentiment that Rajabala had. He listened to the Dharma. And he realized that, as he said, the world is swept away, it has no shelter, you have nothing of your own. In other words, inconstancy, stress, pain, not self. But then it's a slave to craving. It wants more of the same. When have you had enough? There's another place where the Buddha points out that if you take delight in sight, sounds, smells, taste, tactile sensations, ideas, you're delighting in stress, you're delighting in pain. Now, some people say, why are you bad-mouthing the things of the world, things of life? It's because there's something better. That's what you always have to hold in mind. There is something better. Sometimes that word stress is translated as dukkha, is translated as unsatisfactoriness. There's a way in which it's right, but there's a huge way in which it's wrong. It is unsatisfactory because there is something better. But it sounds as if well, if you could simply change your standards, learn how to be satisfied with things, then you'd be okay. And that's a lot of what modern Dharma teaches. Accept the fact that things change, don't want them to be any way different, and you'd be okay learn some equanimity. That is not the escape from suffering. That's not the escape from unsatisfactoriness. The escape is realizing that you're implicit in making these things. When the Buddha says that the objects of the senses and the senses themselves are fabricated, it's not simply that they depend on conditions, but you play a role in getting engaged.
it's because you still find delight in these things that you keep coming back. So in the meantime, he says, delight in the path, even though the path is made out of intentions, thoughts, words, deeds. Still it's a set of intentions, it's a set of aggregates that provides the way out. You have to depend on this body, with all its illnesses and its aging. as an object for practice. Either you take it as an object of contemplation, or you focus on the breath. Contemplating in terms of the 32 parts of the body, focusing on the breath in terms of trying to develop a sense of relative well-being. But knowing that you have to give it up at some point. You're going to have to give it up anyway, but it's better to give it up understanding why you took it up to begin with and how you can learn on not to pick it up again. That's what we're aiming at. Because again, there is something better. If there weren't something better than all this, the Buddha wouldn't have taught. As he said, if, if there weren't a true happiness to be found by developing skillful qualities and abandoning unskillful ones, he wouldn't have taught that. But it's because there is a benefit that goes just beyond the ordinary coming back to better things. So here's our opportunity. We don't know how much time we have. After all, the Buddha says, days and nights fly past, fly past. What am I becoming right now? Are you becoming a better person? Someone who's less reliant on the pleasures of the senses and more reliant on the pleasures of the path. Or is it the other way around? You're the one who has to judge. As he said, the Dharma is found through a combination of commitment and reflection. You commit yourself to the path. How well you committed. That's what you have to reflect on. And if you say, well, I'm doing enough so I can come back fairly comfortably. John Mahabhu has a nice comment. He says, people who are planning their next lifetime, don't really believe in rebirth, because they don't understand how risky it is. We have no idea what karma we have in the past. That might suddenly barge in at some point and take us off to some place where it's going to be hard to practice. But we do have the opportunity to practice now. to make the most of it. Try to be uncomplacent. Try to be heedful. Because those are the qualities you have to depend on. If you're missing those qualities, then the, the practice begins to fall apart. You start thinking, well, I'll make a practice of relaxing my way to awakening. We're taking the easeful path. I was listening to a Dharma talk from another tradition last night, in which the teacher was saying he didn't like the idea of translating samadhi as concentration, because simply the idea of concentration makes you tense. There's something you have to do to get the mind focused, as opposed to simply allowing it to be st peaceful and still. Well, peaceful and still, but not focused, means that you're just drifting around. You can't clone awakening. You hear about awakened people being at ease. And John Swart gave the image of the difference between eating and being full. When you're eating, you have to find the food, you have to fix the food, you have to chew it, you have to digest it. There's a lot of activity that goes in. The feeling of being full is something that's just there. They're two very different things. You can't make yourself full simply by telling yourself, okay, I'll be full. You've got to do what's required. So 
So realize there's work involved. And there are going to be frustrations and there's going to be difficulties. But learn how to delight in taking the difficulties as challenges. Think of the difference of simply enjoying the pleasures of the senses and enjoying the mastery of a skill. That's what the delight in the path is like. You're working on a skill, something that you couldn't do before, but now you can. Problems that you faced before and they seem insurmountable, and now you learn how to surmount them. That's the delight of the path. And yet that's nothing compared to what lies at the end of the path. As the Buddha said, if they could make a deal with you, that they would spear you with spears for a hundred in the morning, a hundred at noon, a hundred in the evening, for a hundred years, three hundred spears a day, a hundred years. But guaranteed at the end of a hundred years you get full awakening. He said, take the deal. And when you arrived at awakening, you would not think that it had been won by pain. The sense of relief that comes, the sense of being totally unburdened, totally unlimited that comes, that would erase any regrets over how much pain was involved. So there is something special that lies at the end of the path. And have a very keen sense that it's worth it. I also have a keen sense that you don't know how much time you have. Last night we just lost a member of our original support community. She lived to be 90 years, but still, at the end of 90 years it seems like nothing, it's all gone. Where are those 90 years right now? They're gone. Once we're born it's as if we've been sentenced to death. And we go around with a sentence hanging over us. We tend to forget that it's there. And we have no idea who's next. But the sentence is going to be carried out. So make sure that you've developed as much of the path as you can in the meantime. If you don't, there'll be a lot of regrets. And it's not a good thing to die with regret. When the time comes, die with a sense, okay, I did what I could. And even if you haven't reached all the way, there'll be a sense of satisfaction there, and that'll carry you through. 